thank you for all your help. Uh, thank you for you guys welcoming us in. Uh, it's, it's been awesome, and you guys have been great so far, and we're excited to uh, get to know you guys more. So um, this morning, we're continuing in our new series, Family and the Bible. Uh, we're going to keep talking about family. Last week was, I uh, got a a lot of reaction, right? Because uh, we were talking about difficult subject. You got to discipline your kids. And uh, we talked a little bit about disciplining physically and how that works. And uh, we, we want to keep uh, talking about that. Um, not so much the physical part, but the other part. Like, how do we discipline them if it's not something that you need to spank your kids with, right? Um, and uh, how would you discipline a kid who is no longer little and is not getting spankings anymore, uh, how do you discipline your preteen or teenager, right? Uh, that's more complicated, right? So uh, some of you guys who have teenagers, uh, you guys already have been through this. You know what we're talking about. It's difficult, right? They say uh, that that is, you kind of, when you have teenagers, that's, you learn why certain animals will eat their young in the wild. Um, <laughs> God's smart. He gives us little babies that are so cute that you're like, oh my God, I love them so much, so that you don't end up taking them out when they become teenagers. So um, we are, we're going to be going through Ephesians. Again, we're out of order, but we're starting here in Ephesians 6, 4. And so it's the same verse as last week. It says, and you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Okay. So uh, we talked about last week that fathers is not just talking specifically to males, but it actually is talking about parents. So it could talk about mothers and fathers. And then uh, it talks about bringing them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. We'll get back uh, later on. We'll talk about provoke your children to wrath. Um, but I want to talk about bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. And what we saw is as we were going through that the word training actually in the Greek talks about chastening. And that word chastening talks about, it means physical discipline. Uh, but admonition is different. Admonition is using any means possible to teach your child or to correct your child. So that would be using your words, uh, using rebuke, uh, using correction, maybe even using guilt, which it, it was in the definition. I, I don't think guilt is the best way to do it, uh, but that is in the definition of the word admonition. So if we're not talking specifically like we did last week about physically training them, right? Chastening, we're going to talk about admonition today. So we want to go through and talk about how are we going to uh, discipline our children using our words, using different means uh, besides physical uh, spanking, physical discipline. Now, I, I do want to say something that's very important. Um, there are... Um, we want to make sure that physical discipline is one of the last options. Now, it depends on what the, the kid is doing, right? Uh, certain things, they just warrant a spanking, right? But what you want to do is you want to try to talk to them as best you can and then go to that. I have erred on that many times, uh, just coming out threatening with the wooden spoon. That's it. You want the spoon, you're going to get it. And that's not the best way to do it. And uh, my wife had to talk to me. He's like, you can't just keep threatening them. I was like, okay, I'm sorry. Um, so... Uh, we want to go through, we want to talk about how to do this, okay? Um, remember, I want to go through some of the verses we talked about last week. Um, it is uh, just basic biblical principles that come out of the Proverbs primarily, uh, because this is so important that we understand this. We don't want to have kids running wild uh, and just basically dominating uh, everything that's going on. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but you see too many people that are just kind of like leaving their kids off and they're saying, they're fine, leave them alone. And the Bible says, no, that's not fine, okay? So we start off Proverbs 22, verse six, a uh, very simple principle. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it, okay? Now, some of you are testimonies of this verse, right? You guys grew up in this church or in a church and you guys were taught the right way to go. And as a result of learning that, you are still here today and you have survived, you have done well, you're prospering, hopefully you're walking closely with Jesus. Amen, right? Your parents taught you the way that you're supposed to go. Now I'm sure you're thinking, well, my brother or my sister or whatever is not here and they should be here. Uh, it's, it's not, this is a proverb right? A proverb is a general saying, right? It's a piece of wisdom. In general, if you train up a child in the way they should go, they will not depart from it when they are older. But there are some that rebel against it, you know, and that's between them and God. They're going to have to deal with that. 
And uh, they walk away from church. They walk away from God. They walk away from family, maybe. So um, in general, this is the principle. So in general, this is what we want to do. We want to train up a child in the way they should go. And so that means we're going to train them up in training and admonition like Ephesians chapter 6 talks about, right? Okay. Another verse we talked about, which is a little more uh, heavy, is Hebrews 12. In Hebrews chapter 12, we started off in verse 5 and 6. We were talking about how the Lord chastens those he loves. This is what it says. You have forgotten the exhortation, which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and he scourges every son whom he receives. So you look at that and you go, wow. So this is something that God does with us as his children. So this is definitely something that we must do with our earthly children, right? We are to discipline our children. God loves us so much that he doesn't want to leave us on our own. He doesn't want to just say, no, 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 you're fine. Just go. You'll figure it out. God wants to direct us in the paths that we should walk on. And he wants to point us in the right direction. And so sometimes there's some discipline that goes on. And that's heavy to think about. But a God of love disciplines us because of the love that he has for us. Okay? Because of the love that he has for us. So uh, one of the things we saw also last week was that, you know, if, if you love your child, you'll discipline them. Um, and this is very important. So just leaving your child and saying, ah, oh, they're fine. They'll figure it out. That's not love. That's permissiveness. Again, we'll talk about that maybe next week, uh, one of these next weeks, okay? Um, but we have to discipline our kids. That's something that God does. And what he tells us, Hebrews 12, 11, he says, No chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So there is a point to the discipline, Right? There is an end that you're striving for. As you're striving to discipline your kids, you're striving to develop them so that they can follow God and produce the fruit of righteousness. And this is the same thing that God does. It doesn't feel pleasant when God begins to discipline us, but there are times when we need it. And because he loves us and he wants to see our life flourish, he wants to see our lives full of fruit. Then he disciplines us so that we would start to get on the right path and move in that direction, right? Obviously, uh, most of you guys know the, the, the idea from John chapter 15. Uh, you have the, the vine dresser and the vine. Jesus says, I'm the vine. My father is the vine dresser. What does he do? He goes through and he prunes the vine. Why is he doing that? Because he wants to get those dead parts that are not good, cut those off so that the healthy parts will receive more of the nutrients and begin to grow healthier. And so that's what God's doing. He comes in, he disciplines us. And there's times when we're doing things, he's like, yeah, you know what? You're doing pretty good, but you got this area over here we got to address. And so then he begins to prune that area in our lives in order that we would start to live a more spiritually healthy life. And then we could begin to produce more fruit like he wants us to produce. In that passage in John 15, he says that his father, Jesus says, my father will be glorified when you produce much fruit, right? Much fruit, not, not just a little bit of fruit, not some fruit, a lot of fruit. And so God says, I'm going to help you in that process. So we as earthly parents, we're going to come in. We are going to do the exact same thing with our kids. We are going to help them along the path because we love them, because we want to see their life do well. We want to see them be a blessing uh, to our family, to the society as a whole, to the church. And so we want to prune them and discipline them at times in order to get them on the right path in order that they produce the righteousness that we want to see. Okay, two more verses. Proverbs 29, 15. It says, the rod and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Man, that's heavy, right? Bringing shame to your mother. That's the last thing you want to do, right? But that's what happens. We get left to ourselves. We end up bringing shame to our mother. Now, the thing I want to point out here, last week we talked about the rod. 
right? You got the rod, you know, or uh, the switch is what we talked about, right? Some, some people were disciplined with a switch, and you get a little whip with that thing. I bet that thing hurts. I never got a switch. Um, but this week, we want to talk about the other part of it. It says the rod and rebuke. Rebuke. Rebuke means that you're going to strongly correct your children. You're going to use your words, right? This is not physical discipline, but the two go hand in hand. That's why they're in the same sentence, right? But the rebuke will help give your child wisdom in order that they don't bring shame upon their mothers. Mothers, can you guys say amen? Because you're saying, I don't want my kid bringing shame on me, right? So what do we have to do? We got to put them on the right path, right? You got to rebuke them. And sometimes you're going to use a rod. All right. Last verse, Proverbs 29, 17. It says this, same thing. Correct your son and he will give you rest. Yes, he will give delight to your soul. Okay, now this obviously is not just for boys, although boys will need to be corrected. Um, this is also for daughters. Um, I think this could be, uh, in general, correct your children, right? Correct your children. You need to correct your children in order that they will give you rest when you're older, okay? Now, some of you in here, this is, you're fulfilling this as well, right? We have grandparents in here and your children in here and your grandchildren are in here. And that's amazing, right? Because now you're, you corrected your children and now your children are correcting your grandchildren. And now it, it's like the lineage is being formed, okay? This is really important. Grandparents, we'll, we'll talk about this uh, another week, but we're going to talk about uh, your lineage. We're going to talk about... Um, just establishing uh, a heritage in your family that you would be able to have that awesome lineage of people following Jesus. But you want to have that in order that they give delight to your soul, right? So without the discipline, uh, you're not going to get that delight that you want, okay? Now, I want to remind you, we talked about a, a couple of things last week. Not all kids are the same, and so you're not going to discipline all kids the same. Um, some kids, you just look at them and they know, okay, I crossed the line and they back up other kids. You can yell, you can scream. They're not going to listen. They're going to need a little more physical discipline, right? Um, and so you're going to have to get out the, the rod and get a little correction because this is something that they're, they're just not going to listen, uh, because they're, they're so strong, right? So you have to really take each kid in a case by case basis. That's very, very important. Some kids are just easier. Some kids are just stronger. You got to deal with them each differently, okay? But as we go through, we want to talk about today seven rules to proper discipline of kids, okay? Seven. Last time I did five. Last two times I did five, so I want to do seven this time. No, I just had seven. Um, seven rules, and uh, I think these are biblical and we're going to go through and just try and give you guys ways of disciplining that are not physical discipline, right? And, and more, more principles to discipline, okay? Very simple stuff. Number one, teach your kids to love Jesus, right? That goes back. You, you want to train a kid in the way they should go. So what do you do? You teach them to love Jesus, right? This is so, so important. This is the beginning of everything. You want your kids to follow uh, to be a good person, well, they got to follow Jesus. Now, they can try to be a good person on their own without Jesus, but ultimately, they're not going to be a good person because they're going to be living in the power of their flesh. They're going to have their sin dominating their life, and, and they might have sins that are more socially acceptable, but they're still going to have sins in their life, and it's going to have effects upon them for the rest of their life until they die, okay? This is why we need Jesus, right? Jesus came to die on the cross for our sins. He took the punishment for all of our sins there on the cross. And then to prove that he had done that, he rose from the dead to prove to everyone, hey, I really am who I claim to be. And so we need to instruct our children in that. We need to make sure that they understand the significance of Jesus' death on the cross and of course, his resurrection. One of the first things that I ask everyone, and I'm kind of giving this away, um, but the, well, the first question I always ask everybody when I do discipleship with them, why do you believe in Jesus and not one, some other religious leader? Why not Buddha? Why not the Dalai Lama? Why not Joseph Smith? He's got a great church, right? 
And you wouldn't believe the, the, the answers that I get, man. People give all sorts of answers, all sorts of different uh, scriptural things, right? Guys who have grown up in the church, they've been Christians 20, 30 years, and they can't give me the right answer. The answer is the resurrection. Jesus rose from the dead. He died on the cross, but he rose. He didn't just stay in the grave. He rose up, and we have to understand that. I believe in Jesus because he rose from the dead. That's why he conquered death, conquered sin. And so our kids need to understand, why do you believe in Jesus? Because Jesus is the only spiritual leader in the history of the world to rise from the dead. The only one, okay? Other people, they said, oh, follow me. I will lead you to God. I'm the true prophet of God. I'm whatever it is. But Jesus came out and he actually did it. He proved it. And so you've got to teach your kids that. This is something that's so important. Your kids need to understand why do they believe in Jesus? And you train them up. You teach them the Bible. You guys should be reading the Bible to them. Now, we get busy, and so we don't do this every single day because we don't have time. We've actually been in chaotic transition for the last months. <laughs> um, and so we end up missing days of reading the Bible before we go to bed. It's, it's a mess, right? Um, but we're going to hopefully get back into that very shortly now that we have a house, right? Um, but this is something you guys got to do. Go through, read the Bible to them, right? If they're really little, get a kid's Bible and read it to them, right? So they can understand it. If you, if you yeah, I think that if you need a Bible, <laughs> I want to make sure you guys get one. We have all sorts of Bibles here at the church. And I, I, I'm, I'm imagining, I haven't seen them, but I imagine we have a lot of kids' Bibles as well. So um, talk to us. We will get it. Talk to Retta. Retta will get you whatever you need, right? Uh, we want to make sure you guys got your Bibles and that you guys can read this to your kids. And then be an example to your kids, right? Read your Bible. Let them see you read your Bible. Now, the hard thing is, is now we, we got it all right here in our cell phones, right? And so you put them on and you're listening to the Bible. Uh, I listen to you version. It's pretty awesome. Uh, but you can listen to it. Uh, it helps me to stay focused because what I would do is I would read a couple of verses and then I'd be like, huh, that's interesting. And then I would start thinking about it and thinking about it. And the next thing I know, like 15, 20 minutes pass and I'm on verse three and I'm like, oh shoot, I, I need to keep reading. Um, so a lot of times we listen to things, right? That's okay. Um, but make sure your kids are seeing that that's happening, that you're reading, that you're praying, that you're reading and praying with them, right? Raise your kids up in the way of the Lord. If they get their heart aligned with Jesus, if Jesus gets a hold of their hearts, your kids will give you rest. They will be a blessing to you and to your family and to the church and to the community, right? Make sure that they fall in love with Jesus. So teach them to love Jesus. That's the most important thing, right? This is more important than school. It's more important than sports. Your kid could be the greatest athlete on earth and walk away from Jesus and go to hell. And that would be the worst possible scenario. Uh, that you could imagine. Teach them to love Jesus. Number two, teach them to respect adults. Now, obviously, this starts with you. Um, they need to respect you, right? I'm going to say this, and I, I know there's a lot of kids in here. This is unusual. I'm not, I'm not used to teaching with kids in here. Kids, you're not the boss, okay? We got to make sure that that's very clear. Your parents are the boss, and so you've got to respect them, right? Parents, you need to teach them to respect you and other adults as well, okay? So they go to school. They shouldn't be causing problems in class, right? Now, maybe they're getting in trouble. I used to get in so much trouble. I wasn't a Christian. I used to get in so much trouble. Uh, I was always sitting off by myself, you know, like everyone's in their desk, and here's Tom over in the corner sitting at his desk, right? Because Not because I was causing so much trouble, although I did a little bit, but not much, um, but I was just talking nonstop right? Just talking, talking. You know, I know it's hard to imagine, um, but I would be there just talking. And uh, so sometimes things like that happen, you know, it's okay. Um, but if your kid is disrupting the class and doing that, you, you got to deal with that, right? They need to respect their teachers, right? They need to respect different people in the church. They need to make sure that they understand that they are not the ones that order everyone around. Now, you have to teach them to know their boundaries because you do, no, 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 no adult is supposed to touch you. Don't let them touch you, right? That, that's crossing the back, but you need to respect them and, and make sure that you're not talking back to them, mouthing off to them. That's not right, right? And we need to make sure that we're doing that, especially at home, that your kids are not mouthing off to you, okay? So now 
when they get to be teenagers, again, it starts to get difficult because then they're, you're teaching them to be an adult. But when they're little, you teach them very young. You don't talk to me that way. And that's a line that you hear in my house. I'll say that to my, to my kids. Um, they don't do it very often, but I'd be like, you don't talk to me that way. Okay, go to your room. You don't talk to me that way. And that, that's very strong, but you have to make sure they understand. That's not how you talk to an adult. I'm your father. I'm not your friend. Okay, so you have to treat me with respect, right? And you command that. And then they learn, okay, they're in charge, not me. My friend told this story on Facebook. You know, Facebook is, uh, you know, the public forum. And uh, she was walking into a store, and there was some gal walking in with her young teenager. She said she was probably 12, 13, 14 years old. And uh, the, the girl is just there. Uh, I don't, she said she didn't know what happened, but something happened. And she, the girl was just cussing out her mom. She asked throwing every F bomb and everything like at her mom as they're walking into the store through the parking lot, right? And, and my friend was walking there and she's looking at him. She's like, oh my God, I can't believe she's talking to her mom. And her mom's like, stop it. Stop, stop talking like that, please. I'll buy you whatever you want. Just stop right now. I was like, man, somebody lost control along the way. Somehow the, the roles have flipped because that mom didn't stand up and say, no, 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 you don't talk to me that way. You go back home, get in the car. You know, we're not, we're not going to the store. Um, now, I don't know the scenario. I don't know what's going on, but you don't let your kids talk to you like that. You don't let your kids talk to anybody like that, right? Now, as they start to get older and they start to become on, the, on their own and they're all of a sudden, they're 16, 17, 18, you still got a little bit of control. You start to let them go and have a little more freedom. Once they get past that point, now, now they're adults and now they've got to make their own decisions, right? But you raise them in the way they go so that when they're older, they don't depart from that, Right? So when they're young, you start off and say, no, no, don't talk to me that way. No, no, you don't say that. And so that means there's going to be consequences when little kids say things. You're stupid. You know, I hate you. Okay, okay, that's fine. Uh, we're going to deal with that, right? We're going to address that right away, right? Now, I know sometimes little kids are frustrated, and that's how they are trying to express their, their emotions. And you need to let them express their emotions in certain ways, but that's not a healthy way to do it, right? That's not a healthy way. So... Teach them to respect adults and uh, discipline them when that happens, okay? Now, we're going to get to how. Number three, define rules and consequences, okay? Make sure they know the boundaries. You don't say that, okay? You can say that. That's okay, but don't say this. You can say, I'm angry. I, I'm not happy. That's fine. Express your emotions. Give me some feeling words. I'm sad. I'm frustrated. I'm angry. That's good. That's a healthy way to communicate. But I hate you. I don't love you. I don't want to live here anymore. That's not healthy. Okay. Now, teenagers, you, oh, you don't want to live here? No problem. Door's right there. Go on out. Go get a job. Okay. Um, but you start to define the consequences. If you do this, you're going to get a timeout. If you do this, you're going to get a spanking. And you make it very clear. And this is so important for parents to sit down together and define this. And you think like, really? Do we have to sit down and talk about this? Yeah, you do. This is the future of your kids. Kids thrive under structure. Okay? This is, I, I've seen this over and over again. Psychology talks about it. I worked at a couple of kids' camps and daycares when I was younger. They all said the same thing. Kids need structure. They need organization, right? So when it's just like, go out and play, they, they'll go out and play. But it might get a little bit chaotic. Now, there is time when you go, hey, it's outside time. Get out of the house, go outside and play. That's fine. But then you bring them back in. That's a, a, a time. So we would do that, you know, I remember when my kids were real little, they, they can only do something for so long, right? After a while, they start to go crazy because they're like, okay, the kid's not going to sit when they're four years old and do something for three hours. That, that can't happen. So what do you do? We come downstairs and we had an activity in the morning, right? And then we would move out into the backyard and we would do something. And then we would go upstairs and we would do something. And then we would go out front and we would do, and you're moving them, but there was a structure that we tried to follow. And then at this time we stopped, we're gonna eat lunch, and then we're gonna go back and we're gonna do this afterwards. They like that structure. It gives them security, knowing that this is as far as I can go. This is where the fence stops, right? This is where the fence is where it like holds me in. Kids need structure. So if you can go through with your spouse and define, okay, if they're gonna do this, then this is gonna be the consequence, okay? And define that and explain that to them as best you can. Now, 
hard to do because you can't think of everything they're going to do. Like, well, if you do this, well, what else? They could do this. Well, what if they do this? Then you, you start to think about these scenarios, but you try to give them the structure, right? And then you know, okay, I told you not to do that. Now you're going to sit here. You're going to sit here for whatever, 10, 15 minutes, whatever it is, and you're going to have a timeout, right? For little kids, awesome way to go, right? You don't need to hit them because they did touch something they weren't supposed to touch, right? You just put them in timeout. They hate that. They sit there. They start dancing when they're on the stair, right? They're like, get me out of here. And you're like, no, no, sit. You're going to sit. And if you get up, then you're going to start your time all over, right? And you hold them to it, right? Um, some people have issues uh, with their uh, kids eating, right? Some kids, they don't eat. That's okay. There are ways to deal with that, right? So there was a story I heard, this little boy, uh, he was the youngest. They had several kids, and I, I don't remember how many kids it was. I don't know, it was four or five or six. It was something like that. Big family. Youngest one, they're always the problem, right? Not always. Um, I'm the youngest. That's why I say that. Um, so the youngest, tend to, they tend to test the boundaries, right? The oldest kids, they follow the structure a little bit more usually because they get rewarded for that. Then the youngest is like, well, they get rewarded for everything. I'm going to do things differently, and they start you know, causing problems. Well, this, this kid was always having difficulty with eating, always complaining. And so he, this mom got this, uh, this training, right, from, from a uh, psychologist. Uh, and so kid comes down, sits down at the table, and he's like, oh, we have to eat this again? And she said, oh, no, no, no problem. And she took the plate away, threw it in the trash. And she said, oh, you're free. Go play. And he was like, really? And she's like, yeah, yeah, go play. And he's like, all right. And so he went off and played, right? Well, he didn't eat dinner. And then, so about an hour later, he's hungry. And he's like, oh, mom, I'm so hungry. And she's like, no, no, your dinner's gone. You don't get to eat. And he was like, what? No, 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 you're done. You go to bed. Go, go upstairs, take a shower, and get ready for bed. And he's like, but I'm hungry. Sorry, you lost it. And so he went to bed, and he was hungry, and he was crying. Well, he woke up in the morning, came down. He ate everything in sight, right? No complaints. And you know what happened? The next night when they brought out dinner, he didn't complain. He just ate the food. He said, man, if I complain, they're going to take my food and they're going to throw it in the trash. So I'm not going to do that. So it's a very simple way of disciplining your kid and teaching them a lesson, right? Now, some people go, they take it a little stronger, right? They'll take it and they wrap it up, put some saran wrap on it, put it in the fridge. And then the next morning they said, here's your breakfast. You didn't eat it last night, so you need to eat your dinner. And they'll give it to them again right? That's another way if you want to take it another step. Um, but what you do is you define those consequences, right? You define the consequences. There's no physical discipline here. You're just defining, hey, if you're going to complain about the food we make, no problem. You don't have to eat it, but you're not going to eat anything else. You're, you're going to go to bed hungry, right? So that's tough. Some people say, oh, that's not very nice. Your kid's not going to get sick. They're not going to die. They're not going to stunt their growth because they missed one meal. They're going to learn a lesson, right? And so you teach them that lesson. It's very important, right? So to find your consequences, right? Number four, have integrity with your words, okay? This is one of the hardest things as a parent. Man, this is so hard because your kids are constantly going crazy, doing things, and then you say something and you got to do it. You got to carry it out. So when you're like, that's it. When we get home, you're going to get it. And then what happens is you get home, they're like, ah, it's not that big of a deal. I shouldn't have said that. They're fine. Okay, go play. And then your word, you're teaching them, your word means nothing. Your word means nothing. Okay, so it's better to never say it than to say it and not complete it. That's very important, right? It's better to never say it than to say it and not complete it. So if you say, hey, when we get home, you're going to get it, then they need to get it in some form, right? Um, when you say, hey, that's it, you're going to lose your cell phone, your TV, your video game, whatever it is that you're going to take away from them, you got to do it, and you got to hold them to it, right? If you say, hey, you're going to have a timeout now, and you're going to be here for 10 minutes, they have to sit there for 10 minutes. You have to keep your word, otherwise you're teaching them, say whatever you want, doesn't matter. Words matter, right? Words matter, and your integrity is so important as a Christian, and this is so hard. It's so hard because we say things and then we're like, oh, that was a mistake. 
and then we want to take it back. And so then there, there's times when you have to take it back, and you know, it gets very complicated. We have to try our best to have integrity with our words. This is so important for us as parents, right? This is one of the hardest things that you'll ever do, um, and you have to try to do it over and over again. Hey, I said this. This is the rule. We said it earlier. You know the consequences. You have to get it, right? You have to have the consequence. So make sure that you're not threatening your kids all the time. Otherwise, uh, you're going to have consequences um, because you're not going to complete your word. And then that's going to end up affecting them. And then there's going to be issues that you're telling them to do something and they're not going to listen because they know it doesn't matter what mom or dad says. They're not going to carry it out so I can get away with it. And, and kids are smart. I know you kids are listening. You guys are really smart. You guys know which parent is the weak one. And so you go after them, right? You know, like, hey, uh, if, if I go, I, I remember I used to go and I'd ask my mom for money, right? Hey, mom, can I have 10 bucks? And she'd be like, okay, you can have 10 bucks. And then she'd get out her piece of paper and write $10 and write the date on it. And, and, and she'd put a list on there of all the money she'd given to, given to me because I was going to owe her the money back. And I was like, man, my dad? Oh, he was easy. He's like, dad, can I say, oh yeah, how much you need here? Just start handing out money. Sometimes he'd be like, hey, don't tell your mom I gave you this, you know? Um, and I don't know if they're listening right now. They've been listening to sermons, so uh, maybe my dad's going to get in trouble right now. Um, but yeah, the, p- kids know which parent is the weak one. So you guys got to work so that you guys are on the same page um, and keep that integrity going, right? Okay, got to keep moving. Uh, number five. This is going back to what we talked about last week, right? Don't yell often, right? I put the often in there because it's hard, Right? We talked about yelling last week. We all end up yelling. We're trying not to yell, but then we end up, you know, something happened. You're like, hey, cut it out. Told you to stop it. You know, and it just comes out. We got to try our best to save yelling for emergencies, right? When you really are, are getting on them or when they really are in danger and you need to yell. It's like the boy that cried wolf, right? He's crying wolf, he's crying wolf, he's crying wolf, and people are coming out, and then finally like, ah, whatever, wolf, 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 and then no one comes out, and uh, bad things happen, right? Uh, you're, you're constantly yelling, and then you tell your kid, no, no, don't go over there, and they're ready to, you know, fall in a pool, or, you know, fall off some cliff, or whatever it is, um, and they're not listening because you're yelling all the time anyway. It's just another time that mom or dad is yelling. So, we got to try to save that as best we can. Try to keep your yelling for things that are very, very important if you can, okay? Um, so what do we do? Try to stay calm, of course. You know, and they, you got all these worthless things, you know, count to 10, you know, walk away, you know, all these different things that, you know, you're, you're getting frustrated. It's not going to help you, you know. Um, but what we want to do is we want to try to stay calm and we want to just simply take things away, right? Um, you know your kids, you know what your kids love, okay? What do they love most? Take it away, okay? That's how you discipline kids without physical discipline, right? So especially when it comes to teenagers, it gets real easy, right? Especially today's day and age. Uh, we, we met these awesome people over in Italy, um, and they had two teenagers, and their youngest was uh, about the same age as Sarah. And... Uh, they were telling us, this guy, John, he was telling us stories. He said, oh, it's so easy to discipline them now. When now they're teenagers. He's like, now they just start mouthing off. He's like, okay, phone. And you just take their phone away. He's like, and then they walk away. They start, like, you know, run their room. They get all upset because they don't, they don't know what to do. Uh, one guy said, he said, I saw my, my, my daughter's chin for the first time because they're always like this. <laughs> and all of a sudden they can look up. Um, yeah, you guys know their pressure points, okay? Sorry, kids, to to blow this for you guys. Um, But everyone has pressure points. What do they love? They love video games. Take them away. They love TV. Take it away. They love a tablet, a a cell phone. Take it away. They love going out with their friends. Take it away. Okay. They love driving. Take it away. Right. When I was in, uh, when I was in high school, I I got in a lot of trouble and my mom took away uh, my driving privilege. She actually cut my license in half. And I was like, oh, come what? Couldn't you just take it away instead of cutting it? Now I've got to go get a new one and pay for it, you know? Um, she was angry. So um, take away, don't, don't cut their license, but take away the car, right? Um, and th- this, is, this is very simple because you don't even have to yell to do that. Just, hey, cell phone right here. Hey, keys, give me the keys. Yeah, you lost it. 
And uh, they, they know. You don't need to yell. They know they did wrong. Uh, they're going to get mad. They might yell at you. No problem. Here, give it to me. You lose it for another week. Yell more. Come on. Um, just, just take away what they need. This is the way you discipline kids. Um, there was a, a story about a, a kid. He was a teenager, and uh, he was mouthing off to his mom. And his mom had been prepared for this. Like, when, she, when he mouths off, this is what you do. And, uh, but he needed to get going because he had practice for some sport. I don't know what it was, football, soccer, baseball, basketball, whatever. And uh, he loved sports, right? And so he's mouthing off to his mom, and she's like, okay, okay. And, and then he's like, okay, mom, you need to take me to practice. And she's like, no, I don't. Take yourself. But he couldn't drive. So how is he going to get there? And she's like, well, it's a long walk. You better get started. And so then the kid was like, What? And he's like, yeah, you're talking to me like this. You think I'm going to drive you around? I'm not your taxi. I'm not your taxi. You go out and you walk. And so then that kid had to grab his stuff and try to run to practice because he was already late and everyone was already probably there. And so there's no one that he could call to come pick him up. And so he ran to practice and then he's late for practice. And then you're late for practice. Then you got to run. And then you might not start because you were, you were late for practice. And so then it has all these consequences. And so then he's learning, okay, you're going to mouth off to me as your parent. You're going to have consequences on your team now. Ah, oh, well, that hit him right where it hurt. And then he learns, I better not talk that way to my mom, right? So this is very important, guys. You don't need to yell. All you got to do is take away what they love right? Take away what they love. Now, you could always give chores. You could do that, you know, make them do more. I, I don't think that's a great one uh, because doing chores is, that, that's part of your responsibility of the house, right? Always tell people like, don't, don't pay your kids money to do chores, right? This is their responsibility. Their responsibility as part of the family is to do chores. I never understood that when I was a kid, um, but we have our kids, they do chores. They don't get money for it, but we try to give money for them, a little bit of money, if they read, right? Let's, let's encourage them to read and we'll get, they'll get money by doing that. And that's going to help them a lot more down the line by being good readers, right? Um, but disciplining them and making them do chores, it's like, well, this is part of your responsibility of being part of this family, right? Everybody has a role. So um, I, I don't think that's the best way to do it. Just take away what they love, right? All right, two more. We're almost done. Number six, give more vitamin E, not praise. What is vitamin E? encouragement okay encouragement kids need encouragement they need lots of encouragement and so you can go through and you can give them encouragement all the time hey great job hey that looks fantastic you really did a good job on that you must be proud of yourself right these are great expressions that you can use to encourage your kids praise is a little bit different praise is you're the greatest Oh, you are the smartest. Man, this is, you are so good at this. It's like, no, no, no. That's not healthy for kids, actually. We cross the line trying to encourage our kids. So we want to make sure that we go through and we encourage our kids and tell them they did a great job, right? Great job. That should be your go-to all the time. Great job. That's awesome. Great. Okay? But when you start doing like, you're awesome. Look how awesome you are. You're the best. Like that is crossing the line. And then that starts to cause problems with their ego. Uh, as they start getting older, they start thinking, I'm the greatest, right? We have, you know, people have talked about, sociologists and all this stuff, talked about the effect on millennials, right? The millennials have these problems. They're going into the workplace and they're not able to, to keep a job. They're not able to stay in one place. Why? Because they've been praised ever since they were little that they think they're the greatest. And so they come in and they're like, they, they get out of college and they think, okay, I should be making a hundred grand to start off. And this place is not treating me the way that I should be treated. So I'm going to go find another job. And they're bouncing around from job to job to job. And of course, they're going to learn eventually. Um, but we're having a difficulty in the workplace to maintain these millennials because they've been praised way too much. Okay. Now, there, I'm sure there are other issues as well, but this is one of the main issues. Okay. We don't need to praise our kids but we have to encourage them. Encourage them in what they do. What do they love to do? Encourage them to do it more, right? You're, you're here to find a way to, for them to use their giftings and their passions, right? So if they love sports, great. Encourage them to do sports. Hey, good job. Keep it up, right? Doing great. They love arts, right? Get them into art. Praise them, or, or sorry, encourage them for the things that they do. Don't praise them. Um, 
but we have to be very, very careful. We don't want to lie to our kids. A lot of times we, we will lie to them uh, in order to try to be positive. Um, they do something that's not very good. And like, oh, that is fantastic. You did great today. And it's like, they didn't do very good. It's like, no, no, be honest with them. Okay. So, you know, you can imagine a kid, he's playing baseball. He strikes out four times in one game, has an air out in the, in the infield and then come out like, Hey bud, great game. You're fantastic out there. He knows that's a lie. So you come out and say, Hey bud, tough game today, huh? Next time's going to be better. Right? You just twist it a little bit. Give them a little bit of encouragement. Next time we're going to get them. We're going to, let's, let's practice a little bit this week. We're going to get that curveball down and you're going to rip it apart. So um, we want to encourage them at everything they do, right? Encourage them in everything they do. This is very, very important. Okay. Last point. Number seven, apologize when you're wrong. Parents, you are not Jesus, right? Jesus is Jesus. And you are a sinner, okay? We're saved by grace, <laughs> praise God, right? But we are sinners. And so we make mistakes. And when we make mistakes, what are we supposed to do? Apologize. That's what our kids are taught to do. Like, hey, you need to apologize to him. You hit your brother, you know, apologize to him. We have to do the same thing to set the example, okay? When we lose our temper and we start screaming, and we start doing things that we're not supposed to be doing on these seven basic principles. What do we do? Apologize, right? What you're doing is you're telling your kids, hey, you know what? I'm not perfect, just like you're not perfect. And I'm sorry. And I want you to know that I love you and I know that I messed up. And so we can come, we can talk when we messed up. What you're doing, you're opening up the channels of communication. You're allowing your kid to see like, oh, they apologized when they were wrong. So now I need to go and apologize when I'm wrong. And so you start getting communication and, and that apology and that forgiveness is the basis of all relationships, right? This is what the gospel is all about. It's about forgiveness. Jesus died on the cross to forgive us of our sins. So we have to admit, yes, I'm a sinner in order to receive that forgiveness from him. Well, it's the same thing when we have relationships. We need to apologize in order to restore the relationship that's broken because of our sins. So if your kid is sinning, they need to apologize because they're sinning and they, they've broken the, the, the relationship there, right? They, they've caused uh, uh, some sort of separation as a result of their sin. They need to apologize. Well, if you do the same thing, then you need to apologize to make sure that there is restoration of that relationship right? We've all done it. Man, I've done it several times, man. You lose your mind. You scream at your kids. You send them to their room, whatever it is. And then afterwards, you're thinking, man, I just lost my mind. What's wrong with me? How am I supposed to be an example to my kid when I'm screaming at him like a madman? And then you have to go in. Hey, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I screamed. I'm, I shouldn't have. I lost my cool. Please forgive me. I love you. I'm sorry for that right? And, and there's a restoration. I'll, I'll tell you what, kids are super forgiving. So go in and make sure that you apologize, right? Okay. Now you're, again, you're setting examples so that they can apologize when they do something wrong and, and teach them that too, right? That, that when they make a mistake that they apologize. And so then that is teaching them in the future when they have more important relationships, you know, when they start getting into romantic relationships, when they get married and all that kind of stuff, then they know, Hey, when I mess up, I better apologize. Okay. Husbands and wives, this is for you guys as well. We'll talk about this later on. Uh, you need to apologize when you make a mistake, right? So um, make sure that you're setting that example for your kids. This is so important that your kids learn that you are a sinner just like them and you need forgiveness just like they do. And then they see that example and they can grow in that, right? So this is it. You're going to raise your kids in the training and admonition of the Lord, right? Okay, so training them, physical discipline, but also admonition, which is using your words, right? Using consequences. People, kids need to understand that there are consequences for actions. Again, if you sit down and you define that with them, hey, if you're going to come home late, then you're going to lose the privilege to take the car, right? That, that's a very simple way to explain things to a teenager, right? This is the action. This is the consequence. 
They have to understand that because then people get out in the real world and they get outside of your house and then they think there's no consequences and there's all sorts of bad things that happen, right? And you, you see it. You see things that happen in the world. You're like, man, what was that guy thinking? Like this guy did this, this guy did that and they thought they could get away with it. Like they didn't realize there'd be consequences that social media would swarm them and try to turn their whole life off. They didn't understand that, but you got to teach them that at home, right? So make sure you're following these principles. If you guys have any questions about them, uh, feel free to come and talk to me afterwards. But I want to make sure that we understand uh, these are some good things to follow. Even though we make mistakes, we're going to keep trying our best to do this as parents. Kids, this is not an opportunity for you guys to condemn your parents. It's an opportunity for you to forgive your parents, right? If they've made mistakes. I'm like, Dad, you're really blowing it, man. What's going on? Okay? This is your opportunity to show grace to them like Jesus showed grace to you, right? And uh, parents, you feel like, hey, man, I'm blowing all these things. Okay, let's start praying. Let's start praying that we can be better parents, right? Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you so much uh, for the exhortations and the corrections that the scripture gives us. And uh, we ask, Lord, that you would help us as parents to be the best parents that we can be. Uh, we are so flawed and uh, so not Jesus, but we want to be more like Jesus. And so we ask, Lord, that you would fill us with more wisdom and more love and uh, help us to lead our families in the paths that they're supposed to follow. So bless these kids in here today. I pray that you would give them more grace, more blessing, more favor upon their lives, and that you would help us as parents to continue to raise them up in the way they're supposed to go. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.